The recent taxi strike in Cape Town has seen lawlessness on the roads, but the Cape Muslim Congress, Siagia Adams, says this needs context. He says public transport is reversing back past apartheid due to corruption, theft and vandalism. Adams joins us now all the way from Cape Town, of course, to talk more about uh, this particular concerning topic. And Yaga, thank you so much for your time and joining me. I think when I saw your article online, it really just, um, you know, just uh, enlightened those who have read it about truly the state of lawlessness. Yes, the taxi strike happened. We saw the chaos and the violence associated to it. But there is context. There's history when it comes to the taxi industry, uh, the transport industry in this country, and how it leads to the state of lawlessness. Take us back. I think that the problem started when uh, we had people that were setting trains alight inside Cape Town Stadium and across the Cape Flats. Trains were burning a few years ago, and to date, nobody of substance has been arrested, and nobody was taken to court, and nobody went to prison. The problem was that when our uh, transport main supply, which was the trains, were bl literally brought to their knees it created a much bigger problem which led to where we are today. Then the COVID situation came in and most of our railway network that had existed for decades and almost 50 years, much of it was stolen, much of it was uh, abused, much of it was vandalized. And that created a major problem because in any metropolitan area, trains are a major method of transport. So when the trains went offline, for lack of a better word, we became dependent on our roads and our buses. Mm. And that in itself was a problem because had we had our trains in 100% capacity, we would not have had the chaos that we saw on the roads in Cape Town that caused the misery to many parents and many children trying to get home from school. And I saw them myself walking from Mowbray bus terminus all the way along the roads of the Cape Flats trying to get home in the dark. And that was a terrible, terrible sight. What I'm arguing is that if the national government is unable to bring our trains online 100%, then they must allow the provincial government and the city government to take control over our transport train network and let us do the job where they are unable to do the job so that we do not become dependent on one mode of transport, mm. neither on the buses, neither on the taxis, nor on the train, but that we have a, a, a multidisciplinary approach where our commuters have access to some sort of transportation to get them to work and from home so that we are not help hostage by any future strike or any sector of the transport industry. Yeah, you also say this because, and I quote here uh, in your article, society cannot progress when a minority threatens the majority. Has that been evident to you time and time again when it comes to the transport industry? Yes, that is true. I tell you why. Yeah. Because of apartheid spatial planning, we have seen that the egresses and the, uh, the in entrances and the exits to townships, whether it be a black township or a colored township, they are basically very limited, which means the access to the township, the colored or the black township, can be very quickly closed. For example, if you burn one tire at the entrance of Samora Michelle in Cape Town, then nobody can come in or go out. And I think that is very unfair. Why? Because whenever whatever sector of society, especially the transport industry, has a problem. They tend to want to burn tires. And when they burn tires along, let's say, Jake Schelvel route, then basically what they are doing, they are blocking the entire Mitchell's Plain, which is home to more than a million residents. They are blocking that road from, for people coming out of Mitchell's Plain to any part of the rest of the city to get to work and to get home. And mm. that is completely unfair that a million people must be held hostage by a handful of people because no society can progress when so many people are held hostage by so few. And we are not saying that the legitimate gripe of those who are protesting is not real. What we are saying is it is unfair to the progress of any society, the larger collective 
when a few people make their problem the entire society's problem. That cannot be tolerated in yeah. any society. Uh, uh, yeah, I want to also just touch on, you know, the issue around taxi uh, drivers who've been issued fines. This for offences um, that they've caused on the road. Do you find that system to be productive when they're handed over fines? Because they are saying that when the city uh, of Cape Town or the province, you know, the Western Cape government impounds on the vehicle, Santaco at least has mentioned that they regard that as extortion. But, but what does it tell you about the behavior about of, you know, some of the taxi drivers on the road who receive countless fines over and over again, yet we still see the same, you know, behavior and way of driving on the roads as it currently stands that ultimately now leads to impounding of vehicles. I would like to start off by saying this, and this is a very important point, that no human being is perfect. We all make mistakes, but we must rectify our errors and we must caution ourselves and then we must remedy our own behavior. Now, let me give you an example of what happened a few years ago. A taxi driver severely injured a Swiss German national who was on holiday in Stellenbosch. The man became a quadriplegic and had to go back to his uh, uh, host nation, his, to his country, uh, Switzerland or Germany. You can Google that detail. But it cost the road accident fund a billion rand. So the road accident fund sent a representative to Switzerland, Germany to go and negotiate a better deal. Eventually, we got away with paying 500 million rand to this Swiss German gentleman. 500 million rand. What happened to the taxi driver? He got a 500 rand fine, didn't spend a single day in jail, and he went on with his merry life. That single individual taxi driver cost our taxpayers, our ratepayers, our economy, 500 million rand. Now, I ask you, is that justice? The problem that we have today is we have laws that are not translating into justice. And what we require is justice. When, for example, I live in the Bome Estate area, when taxi drivers unfortunately decide that they are now going to use the national N2, the Nelson Mandela Boulevard, as a stop and go, when they decide to drop off people on the highway and then just move into the traffic, where the average speed is anywhere from 80 to 100 kilometers. What are the risks of us that's trying to get to the city going to do when they using the N2 as a stop and go? They are creating chaos. Now, when there is no behavior change, when we see that this person refuses to improve on his own behavior, society must act. Mm. And what we are saying is, I would suggest impounding the vehicle is a minimum. When you're creating chaos on our roads by using the N2 as a stop and go, right. I think that that person must spend some time in prison so that he can actually sit and think about his behavior because there are many ways for him to solve that problem. He can turn up, for example, where the hotel is in Warmer State, and right. then drop his passengers and then get back onto the highway again because there are roads that allow him that access. But because he refuses to change his behavior and he wants society to adapt or adopt his behavior, we cannot as a society allow that type of chaos to continue. All right. So it, it becomes necessary for us to protect society as a collective Thanks, against yeah, yeah. those individuals who want right. to make society chaotic.